All right, guys, welcome back to episode 13 of the Speed Up and Get Your Hits podcast. Thanks for uh, tuning back in. As always, my name is Billy. I'm with Spec Trained, and with me, I have Nick from Bellox Training Group and Brennan from Vortex Edge. And this is just a podcast by some some dudes that like to shoot and, and help other people get better at shooting. Uh, about shooting and getting better at shooting. So hopefully that's what you're here for, and uh, and we'll have a good time with it, fellas. We uh, here we are. What what what's what's been going on? Or kind of this week in in shooting stuff. What you guys been up to? Anything interesting? Yeah, I've been uh, switching my standards up a little bit. So yeah. typically before I would have uh, what you would kind of I guess uh, call like a pass fail type standards, right? Mm -hmm. Um, where we were, we will shoot a specific amount of uh, rounds at a certain distance, and if all rounds are not um, within the uh, given accuracy zone within the par times, uh, it's a fail. Um, and what I've noticed uh, in doing this for a little bit now is there's been a couple dudes that have completely crushed the times, the par times of the, of some of the standards, but they've dropped one or two charlies. Um, and to me, it's not really fair to tell those guys that, Hey man, you didn't pass, uh, because you had two tight Charlies, right? Right. Um, so I, I've switched up my standards a little bit. I've added some, some, uh, stages, if you will, to them, right? There's, there's three strings of fire for both my pistol and rifle stages or classes or whatever. Um, and they're all going to be scored within hit factor instead of just a pass fail now. So. To me, it just it lends itself more to performance type of shooting rather mm -hmm. than, you know, people trying to be so careful that they go slow, or people thinking, "Hey, man, I could just go fast." Uh, it's just I don't know. I feel like hit factor scoring is super fair, so I wanted a way to add that in together um, into the standards. So I think it'll work out pretty good. Very cool. I dig it. I think that is uh, definitely a, a better way to go about it for for general general standards um, for sure. It, it just it just makes sense, you know. There's um, I, th I think every every good sh shooting challenge accounts for both speed and accuracy, right? In in, in a sense of of, of weighted, weighted accuracy, if you're if you're closer to the center of the target, obviously you get more points than if you're farther out towards the edge. But at the same time, you know, I think I think in any practice, any, any practical shooting discipline, uh, there's obviously a place where you know if we could just pick a spot on the target where our rounds are going to go and make them all go there, we would do that. But it's like, man, if it's going to take me five seconds to get five rounds right there, or 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 a second and a half to get five rounds like within five inches of right there like which one am i gonna take right and uh and sometimes you ha you're absolutely gonna pick speed over accuracy and so uh, or at least in, in the in exchange for some of that precision accuracy right and so i think that absolutely it's good for our shooting challenges to to account for that kind of same way of thinking for sure i dig it yeah i feel you... like it also like gets people to, like dip their toe so to speak, in like competition, mm -hmm. um, because like especially th this uh, past year, I've had so many people take classes that tell me, uh, "Hey, I've never taken or I've never shot a, a match before," um, and I've had a ton come to classes and go, "Hey, man, I want more of that," and then they went and shot a match, um, and then they get like addicted to it, which I think is freaking awesome. That's cool. Yeah. How are you? Um, are you just like picking a, a hit factor uh, that people have to meet to like actually pass them, or how are you determining that? Yeah, so I'm still kind of undecided on what my hit factors are going to be. Um, mm -hmm. I'll probably have two. I'll probably have one where you win a patch, and then uh, one where you will not only win a patch, but you will win a golden ticket for a free mod light product. That's so. cool. That's cool. I've, um, we've and the way I'm with... them is I, I just I just shoot them essentially yeah. a bunch of times, average my numbers, see what you know, um, see see what hit factors I'm likely to get, right? Because I have to do it in front of a class too, so it can't be so yeah. lofty to where it's like, oh, I can't even pass it at the class. You know what I mean? Um, but I do want it to be challenging. 
Yeah. You don't want like eight people getting a golden ticket every class. <laughs> <laughs> no, it'd probably be the last eight tickets that I could get out. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We, we always have like a final drill of some sort uh, for any of our classes. And obviously like we try to incorporate everything that uh, you learn in that class. Um, but yeah, we've, we've, we usually score at hit factor, but we usually just give whoever shoots at the best, like a thing, like a prize or whatever. Um, I could, I could, I would think it would be a little bit more challenging to try to pick like a hit factor that you have to reach in order to like get the patch or, or, or get a, t uh, a golden ticket or whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's cool, man. Like if you could figure it out with the averages and stuff, like that's legit. Yep. Yeah. That's cool. Yes, I've I've been meaning to shoot them. I know that I need to do that. Uh, I'm probably gonna do that Saturday. <laughs> we'll get you some some info back on that for sure. I'm, I'm awesome. looking forward to it. it. Seems like a pretty cool it. course of fire you sent our way. But uh, yeah, man, good stuff. Brennan, how about you, bro? What you been up to? Um, yeah. So speaking of standards, um, got together with my buddy Justin and shot the uh, T Rex Arms. Uh, Cardin standards. Well, we're planning on doing the pistol standards here, and maybe maybe next week or something. Um, but yeah, super interesting, right? So like, I don't know how many people have actually shot them yet. Um, I certainly haven't seen anybody really on social media outside of maybe like one person shoot them. Um, and uh, it's kind of interesting. Like, I think I know why, right? Like, there's two reasons. One, they're really new, and two, uh, they're actually pretty hard, right? So. Uh, I think that's, I think that, that maybe humbled a lot of people who are like bugging him to, to put them out. Right. Cause they are actually <laughs> yeah. pretty difficult. And like, that's so you know, true. There was like way he, more noise about these standards before they came out. Now that you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like all the comments and everything. When are you going to yeah. come out with the standards? Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then he puts them out he puts his hit factors up online and you know, I, I watched it. I was like, okay, he got like a six hit factor. I don't know what that means, whatever. So I went and shot him and uh yeah i was shooting like uh, mid fives mid to high fives um on you know a couple different ones really good standards though like for, for what it's worth so for anybody who's listening like uh print them out and try them out like the carbine ones most of them I, I, he's got a couple where you need like 200 yards um but most of them are at like 50 yards and in and um difficult stuff right like there's a combination of like some like some like headshots at, at, at 20 like real fast and stuff like that's difficult right um uh there's some there's a portion that's like done at 50 meters which i actually don't see a lot of people shooting rifles at 50 yards or, or more very often um which is actually where rifles are like you know what they're good for mm -hmm. um yeah, it was it was really uh, really interesting. We we ran we ran a couple of them like once uh, twice or maybe three times because uh, we messed stuff up and our cameras weren't working and stuff. But for the most part, we just tried to run each one just once. Um, and I do think that it's a pretty good measure of your skill overall if you do a bunch of them. Um, definitely more involved than just like you know shooting something like the black belt standards or something like that, right? Sure. Um, but I think if you are actually wanting to kind of see where you are, uh, it incorporates a lot of skills that I think are really important. Um, and so, yeah, like shoot it and get a hit factor for yourself and like check in, you know, every couple of months and, and just see. So like if you don't have something like that that you do uh, with rifles, um, which I actually kind of don't do a lot with with rifles uh with pistols it's pretty easy to kind of check up because like a like i'm going to matches or like i'm right. shooting glass fires or something like that right uh but with rifles it's kind of nice to have like a course of fire uh that's not too long um yeah just to kind of check in man so I, th I think it's pretty cool i think it's dope i'd be interested to see what you guys think about it if you uh get a chance to shoot them um i would definitely but, like to it looks cool you know it's one of those yeah it's challenging much like you know uspsa classifier stages like you can't if you're trying to make a standardized drill like that that everybody can run on their own you can't make it too big and complex with like so many targets and like you know it's complex mm -hmm. layout right mm -hmm. but you have to make it interesting and test those kind of dynamic movement skills and all that kind of stuff as well <laughs> it's tough to do that well but uh, it seems like he's, he's got some pretty cool interesting stuff there so yeah i'm definitely yeah. interested to, to run those yeah and sure. i want to say there's like two drills that all you need is like 20 meters yeah. uh and three uspsa targets so for most people that should be doable Yep. Um, if you have any type of range where it draws movement. So, um, even just if you can do those, I, I think they're, they're pretty good, pretty good, uh, pretty good standards. Yeah. 
Very cool. Right on. Well, I'll lead into um, kind of our topic with some of the stuff that I've been up to. So, uh, shot a match this past weekend was went pretty pretty well. Um, it's inter it's it's interesting, man. It's just figuring out different things about the mental game um, as you go. It's like you know I've had. Guys like, uh, you know, Ben Steger telling me for the longest time, like, man, you got to stop, you know, worrying about, you know, um, just kind of having like the most awesome, like just kind of blowing the hit factor out of every single stage that you shoot. And like, <laughs> just try to like have a, a perfect ex execution of a decent plan, like on that stage, which you need to worry about. Yeah. It's like, man, you hear that stuff. Uh, but once, when it, when it sinks in, it's, it's, you know, it's 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 pretty interesting to see the results. I think um, for me right now, especially to start getting ready for some some bigger majors and so forth, it's it's a whole different mindset to some of the stages and stuff. It's, it's it really is just about like trying to come as close to perfect execution um, as possible. Which doesn't by perfect execution, I don't mean like I'm trying to shoot 100 percent of my capability. I mean like trying to shoot 90 percent of my capability all the time with like zero mistakes anywhere right um and it's kind of it's 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 a little bit of a different approach but uh pays off pretty well so um but the weekend before that uh had our performance or our well call it now the competition shooting class <laughs> it's really just a performance pistol class but uh anyway it's pretty interesting right so i think my class like like your guys classes um that I, from what i've seen and uh been a part of right uh, I think good classes um, are, are are organized in a fashion where the blocks build one upon another, right? We usually start with, most classes start with kind of like the fundamentals of marksmanship stuff, like how do you grip the gun and how do you pull the trigger and that kind of stuff. And you, and you build layer upon layer as you go throughout the class, right? Um, and, and my class would, none of my classes would be an exception to that. Um, what, what still is surprising, right? I know we've talked to some about this, um, throughout the, uh, the podcast, but I had probably half the class, um, reach out to me after the fact and be like, Hey, so like, what, what should I work on? Like moving forward or like, what should my training plan look like? That kind of stuff. Right. Um, and it's interesting. I, I think we already had the idea maybe planned for this, this, this podcast, which is like, Hey, um, I just took a class, you know, now what, right? How do I, how do I, what, what should I be doing after I take that class? And I think that sometimes as instructors, like we, we build our classes to, to be a training plan. And it seems obvious to us since we wrote the stuff, right? <laughs> like what we want people to go home and work on from the class, um, or, or how we think they should do that. But I think sometimes it's, it's probably not as obvious to folks, uh, taking classes. So would love to kind of just dive into this topic a little bit um which is, again i just took a class now what right what should i be doing to to maximize value from that class after i leave um you know how long should we be before taking another, another class which what kind of training can i be doing based upon the class that i took you know these kind of things we're going to dive into here uh this evening so i will open the floor fellas what, what do you what do you got what are your what are your tips for folks <clears throat> so i think um first thing is if they're not Number one, if they're not taking notes at a class, um, to me, it's just wrong, right? Like, like you paid to be there, take the notes, even if you're just going to write notes on things that were kind of like massive takeaways for you. Uh, it's typically what I do. Like I'll, I'll write something down that I'm like, dude, that I need to try that at home. That is going to be really, really, uh, cool. And I could see the value in that. Um, but yeah, I would start with legit the first thing on that list that that you wrote down whether it, you know it doesn't even matter how simple it is right it could be something like grip yeah. um you know grip go explore the stuff that that the instructor went over in that class right um i think the exploration of stuff that that you learned in a class or that was taught in a class is pretty much what you need to be doing after that class right because if you're not you like the chances of you getting better at a class. Yeah, you might. That'd be pretty cool. But like, I can't remember the last time I went to a class and I'm like, man, I, that was a huge chunk. And I'm like, I am better now. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You, if you go to classes to take home homework. Right. And if you're not writing down what that homework is, 
and then you forget, I think you're not getting um, your money's worth out of that class. Yeah. So, and I would even take it a step, step further, right? So obviously I think, you know, big, big takeaways, things, things that were obviously impactful to you individually as a shooter. Um, but I think sometimes, you know, I think folks like there, there's really important stuff covered in a course. They don't even realize is a big takeaway for them at the time, but they That's still true. need that stuff. Right. <laughs> so write down all the things like as much as you can. Um, the, at least the salient points, right? And also specifically, um, I, write down with as much detail as you can. I think every every drill or course of fire that you are doing um, throughout the course, I think that's super helpful for folks. Um, you know, it's like, I think folks come into a class a lot of times as an example, and they think, hey, my grip is like super squared away, <laughs> right? And then, you know, like I was talking to you guys earlier about, you know, that kind of the first block in my uh competition class like it the first half of the day basically ends with my ability to drill standards which is build drills at 7 15 and 25 yards so essentially the elements of that are like very simple like you have to know what you need to see with your sights you have to know how to press your trigger and you need your grip super squared away to add forgiveness for those two things and also for recoil control right like the three very very simple elements you have to master right so folks come in thinking that they i think a lot of times already like are, are past the basics, right? Like I have like, you know, a class and like master class type shooters showing up in that class a lot, right? They're like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I already understand grip and trigger control and all that kind of stuff, right? And then we get to the drill and it's like, or, or the test, if you will, like the standards drill. And it's like, okay, well you suck at that, right? So therefore that means you have to go back and work on that other stuff. Um, yeah. And so, you know, if you, if you skip over things you don't think are, are big takeaways for you at the time, uh, then you may, may, realize later you need to go back to that some of that stuff so yeah def definitely taking notes and all the things like nick said we need to write it down I, I i have found that um for me personally my notes uh tend to not be sufficient like i, I always think i'm writing down all the things that i need at the time and i'll like remember the blanks in between my bullet points and then i never do and so I've just started like videoing or like audio recording lots of things now in classes that I take so I can go back and, uh, and review those. So it's, I just feel like it's more comprehensive and catches all the things that I didn't think were super important at the time. But, um, yeah, definitely, definitely super huge. You're, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to work on stuff from the class if you don't remember what was in the class. So yeah, some, some kind of note taking or ways to remember that stuff. Super important for sure. I think too, like, um, yeah, so so I, I guess in in just addition to that, right? Like today, uh, I was we were doing a little pistol work, uh, mm -hmm. me and a couple of the other guys that I work with at Edge, um, and uh, we we're we we're we we're using kind of one of the final drills from one of our uh, pistol classes, um, just kind of as a uh, warm up, and then just gotta see what see where we are, and then the idea was let's break down some of the individual components and uh, kind of work on those. Um, which is uh, a good way to approach final drills, by the way. If, um, if 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 an instructor has a sort of a final drill that combines all the skills that you've been working on or that he's been teaching or whatnot, um, using that, if that's an easy way to remember, uh, <laughs> you know, remember one drill and then kind of start breaking it down and that'll get you kind of back to everything that hopefully he was building up to. Yes. Um, that's, a, that's a good way, by the way. Um, so we're doing that, right? And <laughs> so we were shooting it and we shot it a few times and uh we were like all right so let's break down some component skills right and one of the big things is like this really long uh lateral movement and um billy knows this right because we're working as pete and mike um and so some of that uh stuff like the the three-step entry thing like that uh lead foot pivot um exits those are all kind of newer concepts mm -hmm. um and just something that we don't work on as a team a whole lot. I've put a lot of work into that myself and I still messed up, but um, maybe less time for those guys, right? So we were working on that. And like, when I suggested that we start working working on that and like like really breaking it down and like just just giving each other feedback uh, on stuff, like it was, it was funny, right? Cause I could see the whole act usually, like, <sighs> right? Yeah. Like, oh no, like, right. all right. Okay, so we're gonna do that today, right? <laughs> and it ended up being like super legit, uh, made some like huge improvements. Like Pete wouldn't stop working on it. He like, literally we we left the range and he went and started dry firing it. Uh, it was really cool stuff, right? But like yeah. sometimes it just takes like, 
listen, like do something and then be so honest with yourself about like what sucked about that. And then yep. like, just get like super minute. Yep. And I think like you won't remember that stuff <laughs> if you're not taking detailed notes. Right. And so like, if there's something about like, you just need to write like e entries and exits or specifically lead foot uh, pivot exits or something like that. Right. Or three step entries. And then like write down in your notes, like need to work on this. Right. <laughs> Cause like when you go back and kind of scan through that, you'll be like, Oh yeah, yeah. I remember all that. Uh, but it takes actually kind of getting pretty, pretty nitty gritty, like pretty detailed into mm -hmm. stuff to actually start making improvements, especially if you're already like a pretty good shooter. Yeah. Um, because it's really hard to like, you know, it, it takes a lot more effort to make uh, smaller increments of, of performance gain. So I guess that's what I'd add on to that. Yeah, really good. Really good. I like, I like, you know, you brought up the final drill stuff as well, kind of tagging on to what, you know, we were talking about with like standards drills and stuff. I think sometimes folks see the, the, some of the, some of the drills or the flashier drills, the standards that, you know, instructors do in classes and that is their big takeaway, right? It's like, okay, here's, here's my final drill for the course. I'm just going to take that home and I'm going to do that a lot. And it's like, sometimes the way you get better at the drill is not by doing the drill, right? You have to actually isolate the skills that are required to do well at the drill and work on those things. Example, um, all the old guys at your local range who are stuck in C class or D class, right? They just shoot the drill. Every other Saturday, they shoot the drill. And like they never work on the component skills. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, whether it's whether it's that, whether it's somebody's cold start drill, right? Like oh, like whatever it is, right? <laughs> just doing the drill over and over and over again. Like I mean, it, just by virtue of the fact you're sending rounds down range, like you might see some minimal minimal improvement over time. But that's not the way to actually get better um, at those things. So yeah, isolating those things, breaking them down, and working on them super super uh, important. It's funny you brought up the getting granular with the, the movement stuff. I, I took, I took a cue. I've taken one of the cues that I took as an instructor from, from JJ in a, in a lot of his classes is like when I dive into a super granular block like that in my more advanced classes, like usually no one takes notes. Right. And so I'll take notes for them, you know, <laughs> on, on the, on the back of the target, right. Like write down all the important things that I'm saying, or at least the bullet points. Right. No one take no one takes notes for that block, but afterwards everyone pulls out their phone and takes a picture of the target, right? And it's like, okay, there you go, you have notes now, right? Like Merry Christmas, yeah. uh, because you don't realize a lot of times you know folks just go into a block like that thinking, oh, well, this isn't going to be, you know, super, yeah, I got this. you know, technical or whatever. I'm just going to remember whatever this is, and like after about the sixth point, they've already forgotten the first one, right? And it's like. Um, okay. Now, now it's too late to catch up. Um, <laughs> I do the same thing, man. I, yeah. I do the same thing in every single class. Yeah. I write down everything. <laughs> um, and everyone takes a picture. And then usually what I do with that thing is I give it away to like the most, uh, improved shooter. So I, I that's the it. most improved like shooter that. prize is the target <laughs> with all the notes. <laughs> nice. Nice. I dig it. That's cool. <laughs> no, but, uh, might have to steal that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. So guys, obviously I think this is going to be different a little bit depending on right. Like what kind of class you take. Right. Um, but let's talk a little bit about like specific, like as far as like, how would you, maybe you have a specific example from a class you've taken or, or from a class that you teach. How, how, how should a shooter leave, leave a class and then essentially build a training plan? Like as far as how, how should they be looking at like what to work on from a course, like over what period of time should they work on it? Should they be working on like all the individual skills in that class? Should they work on one for a while and then work for another one for a while? Like how, how would you encourage folks to kind of build training plans based upon maybe a class that they've just taken? So I guess it depends, like you said, it depends on what exactly it is. Um, but like, You've got to be obsessed with the process of how to get there, right? Mm -hmm. Not so much the outcome. I think a good example for me was uh, when I took JJ's, I think it was the second class. Yeah, the second class. Um, we were talking about blending positions together, right? I would mm -hmm. set up stuff um, to blend positions 
in at my range right and i would dry fire it for like 20 minutes before i even shot it right and kind of obsess over where my feet were going is the gun up as i'm coming into that position what can i do better um as i'm leaving that position right can i do things a little bit sooner uh am i taking too much risks um leaving on that specific target stuff like that for me uh was huge it was it was just massive for me um but yeah making it 100 percent about the process like like if for instance what i mean by that is like if you went to the class and were like i'm just gonna move like that like that guy right that that's not what he's talking about in that class mm -hmm. like he, he's giving you step by step and how to do that um and so you should take it that way like take it home that way take it home step by step this is what i'm going to do uh, in order to get better right and start at the very bottom so. yeah yeah i dig it right so i think the um what you're getting at, maybe, maybe even a little bit ahead of some of the the super basic stuff, right? But I think you're, what you're talking about is like kind of like scenario based training. I think too, right? So in other words, hey, I've learned I've learned these new skills, right? These new techniques, different ways to do things. But but when should I actually be using them, right? And like yeah, to where yeah. where are these different things appropriate, right? And on what kind of different targets and so forth, right? And and I think that what you're talking about is is the way to educate yourself on those things right um everybody understands at i think a simple level right after i take a, a class where like entries and exits are worked on and shooting on the move is worked on that like yeah it makes a whole lot of sense to shoot like if i have these targets sitting here at, at three yards and i've got to cover this ground anyway well i'm going to shoot them on the move but if those targets are at 100 yards and i'm shooting on them with a pistol like I'm probably not going to try to shoot those on the move, right? The extremes are obvious, but where those lines start to cross, nobody really knows, right? Until you actually start experimenting with that stuff, right? Like you're talking about set up those course of fires, courses of fire, try it a bunch of different ways. Like just figure out different ways to do things. What happens if I shoot this on the move? What happens if I shoot, you know, not, not going to shoot it the whole way on the move. I'm going to shoot it as a soft entry, right? Or I'm just going to shoot it static from this position to that position. Like just try it all the different ways. Um, run it on a timer, consider your hits and see like where are these different skills appropriate, right? hundred um, percent, hundred percent. Cause so much of, so much of that particular topic is, mm -hmm. uh, shooter dependent. Yep. Right. Like, like when JJ says like for him an attack target is 10 yards or I think he said 10 or 12, doesn't matter. Uh, 10 or 12 yards and in that's his yeah. attack target. Like, but is that your attack target? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Could you hammer on that target at 12 yards and get two alphas? Exactly right. Um, so like exploration of that kind of stuff for you as a, you, the, the specific shooter is super, super important to me. And it goes back even, even, I think even, even more so, right? To like the super, super basic stuff. Um, you know, in, in my class, I can, I can tell you you know, what I want to feel in my trigger at 15 yards on an open target, right? But guess what? Like, <laughs> if you, you know, I'm shooting, you know, a Glock and you're shooting a Beretta, like what I'm telling you about what I'm trying to feel in my trigger has almost no application to like what you're going to do as a shooter, right? Mm -hmm. The only application is hopefully the way that I'm thinking about it and the way that I'm coming to my conclusions will help you figure out how to come to your own conclusions, right? For who you are as a shooter, like how square away your grip is, what kind of trigger you have, like all, all these kind of things, right? But like, you cannot take my explanation of like site confirmation and trigger control at different distances and just like take those home and run with those. Like you have to start with, you know, your version of confirmation one and see how far back can I push this, right? And and, 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 and oh, by the way, this is, after I, do, after I figure that out on an open target, what if it's like a partial target? What if I'm doing it on the move and like all the different variables that stack in, like how far can I push these things and then figure out for you, like, hey, what would the, what's the next logical, you know, you know, confirmation level or adjustment to those things that I would, I would make for me as the shooter. And so that, that, that basic stuff requires, you know, it's just an enormous amount of, of experimentation. Um, and it's got to be a balance, right? Because, and this is something I still struggle with to this day, is sort of skill development training. I think we talked about this in the last podcast, but like pushing for skill development versus execution. 
So, you know, as a new, newer shooter, as an example, if, if you say, okay, here's my version of confirmation one, which is essentially, let's just, we're not going to teach the whole thing right now, but let's just say pulling the trigger, you know, essentially as fast as you can um, on something like an open target at seven yards, right in class. And you get back home as a student and you're like, okay, I'm going to start with confirmation one. I'm going to see how far back I can push it. And you're like, okay, I can only get back to two and a half yards on confirmation one before I start throwing Charlie's, right? Does that mean for you as a shooter, like now you know that confirmation one is only good to two and a half yards? Or does that mean like you probably have some stuff you need to fix, right? Um, and so figuring out that balance of, yes, experiment for you, the shooter, and figure out you know, how things are working for you, different techniques at different distances and different difficulties, but also realize like just because something does, if something doesn't work for you right now, doesn't mean it's never going to work. It might mean you just have work to do to get it to work. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of that, that, that balance in your experimentation game. You know, if you, if you figure out, Hey, um, if I set, set, set these targets up in a certain course of fire, I am faster and more accurate shooting them static from these two positions versus shooting them on the move. Okay, great. That's a great thing that you just figured out. Um, and if you're going to go shoot a match tomorrow, like, yeah, you can, you can use what you just learned to get an optimal score at the match. But if you know in your head, like, Hey, uh, it's entirely reasonable to shoot these targets on the move. And I know for sure, like a good shooter would be more efficient, more efficient doing it that way. <laughs> Don't just settle and be like, Oh, well, shooting on the move doesn't work for me. Like mm -hmm. that's, that's not, that's not a way to, to grow. Right. Um, yeah. except that, okay, right now, yes, here's where my optimal score comes from, but that just shows me where my work needs to be, um, is in, is in the techniques that I'm, that I'm lacking in for sure. Um, so anyway, building, building training plans. I think we, we mentioned scenario based training. That's kind of for me towards the end, because, um, I think that's scenario based stuff, experimentation, uh, like we were just kind of mentioning, like if you, if you, let's say that the techniques you learned in the class are your, are you're kind of brand new at, right? Um, doing that kind of experimentation has limited value. If you suck at both things or like all the options you're experimenting with, right? <laughs> like you, you, it doesn't really matter which one is best for you right now. If you suck at all of them, you need to work on all of them and get better at them. Right. So, um, yeah, I definitely would say for me, generally speaking, if there's new techniques from a course, I think skill set, you know, isolation from the, from the very most basic stuff and then building up is, is super key for an example. Right. Um, and, and first thing we do in my class is, is grip. Um, and I, I generally think that's the way classes should be, uh, because, um, as an example, um, let's say we want to work on trigger control. Um, and we're doing something like trigger control at speed in dry fire. If my grip is nowhere near squared away, then I'm going to be seeing a lot of things in, in, in my sight movement when I press the trigger that might tell me things about when different ways of pulling the trigger are appropriate that are completely not true if I just fix my grip, right? And so it's super important, I think, to start with the foundational basics of things that you work from a class. And I always encourage folks, like, don't, for me, like, if you go to a class and all the things, like, this is one of your first classes, all the things in the class are kind of new to you, like, don't go to the range the first time after the class and try to work on everything you learned. Like, that, you're not going to get anywhere probably doing that. you got to start with the, the basics, the foundational layers that everything else is built on, and put however much time and however much ammo is required to get competent at those basic foundational things before it's going to make any sense for you to try to, to build on that stuff. Um, if you know, again, if you, if you can't grip the gun properly, then it's not really going to pay off a lot to work on, you know, sights and, and trigger control, right? If I can't hit the target standing still at seven yards, it doesn't make much sense to try to do it on the move, right? So you have to build one thing upon the other. Um, start super basic and work on that thing until you, you feel like you've met whatever, you know, minimally acceptable level of, of, of competency at least is for that particular isolated skill and then try building the thing. For me, when I was coming along, what I always like to do, you know, if, if you think about maybe the, the order of the skills you're going to work in, it's like, you know, maybe, maybe grip and then true control and then, you know, site confirmation or how, whatever your, your stack of skills to think about is, 
Um, I, you know, I would work on just grip as an example until I felt like that was good. And then the next time I go to the range, I wouldn't just skip straight to, you know, trigger control, or whatever that is. I'm always going to check up on grip first, make sure that's good and then stack. Right. And so, you know, maybe I got to the point where my first range day, it was like, I spent half the time making sure grip was good. And then I added trigger control, right? I was just like splitting the, the, the range day between those two things. And maybe the next one I was able to work for grip on a while and then work on trigger control for a while and then work on the next thing for a little, for just a few minutes at the end of the range day. Right. And then more and more and more, it's going to be like, yep, I'm going to do the first drill, like trigger control at speed to test my grip when I first get to the range. And I'm like, yep, grip's good in two minutes. And now I'm on to the next thing, but continue to stack those skills until you're like really, really comfortable and confident at those things to make sure you're not wasting time building on top of a sloppy technique. Does that kind of make sense, guys? Is that, that how you would approach it as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. hundred percent. Like you, it, everything has to be consistent, right? Yep. Like if, if you're not working consistency, then like, what, what, what are we doing here? Um, yeah. And you've got to, you've got to start at the bottom and, and like you said, stack skills. Um, if you're, if you're trying to start at the top, then you're not process oriented. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And you're not doing things to get to the top. So I think you're spot on with that. Good. And, you know, ho hopefully, you know, guys, you, the goal for, you know, for me, and I think for the, those of us in this podcast, but unfortunately this has not been the case for every class that I've taken, right? A good class um, sh should not only teach you uh, how to do the thing, it should teach you, you know, how to train and how to practice the thing. And that should also teach you how to test the thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so whatever drill or whatever course of fire or whatever test you have in mind to test a certain set of stacked skills, um, you know, the bottom line is if you're, if you're not succeeding at whatever that test is, then the layers that are required for that skill are lacking and we have to go back and work on those things. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, we talk about this in the podcast all the time, you know, I think certainly I'll speak, speak for myself, um, have, have not reached a point where like, when I go to the range, I'm still working on things like grip and like visual processing of my sights and like trigger control. Right. And, and yeah. the very, very basic things, you never get to a point where, where you're really going to graduate from working and improving on those things, because those are like the key ingredients, um, to great shooting. And so it's, it's kind of dumbfounding, but I know it's, it's definitely a thing, you know, I think, and then it, I, I partially blame the shooting community, right. For classifying the fundamentals as sort of being synonymous with basics, right. Yeah. Um, as sort of like introductory ideas, like entry level. Uh, not novice entry level, level one, like whatever, whatever terminology we use for the fundamentals class it's like okay i need to take my that's like my gun safety class and then after that i get to the cool stuff right um and it's like no um <laughs> you know so it's kind of dumbfounded me but i have folks coming to class that are really like hey i'm an a class shooter i don't need to worry about the fundamentals anymore it's like no dude like absolutely not right that, that is that's actually where some of the big big gaps still are in your shooting right and so don't neglect those those basics so whatever the basics are from a class definitely start with those and then and then build um you know, again, I think for the way the way most classes are probably going to to work is you're going to have blocks, one that, that build one upon another, right? Starting with starting with you know simply hitting the target, then hitting the target at speed, and then adding in various challenges like movement and like different um, you know depending on the class, different things you're going to encounter, right? So start with the basics, build all the way through in your training plan, and and realistically, you know, figure out a way to set goals for yourself for working on the things that you have learned, whether that is mm -hmm. getting to that a certain score on that kind of final drill type setup that you did in class, or whether it's some other way to test those skills, come up with a goal, right? And, and realistically, until you have met that goal, like there's no reason to think that we're done working on the things from that class. And so, you know, for me, um, especially when I was, especially when I was coming up, I mean, I think my first several classes, I mean, it was, I would say it was a good year for me probably before I felt like I had really worked through the stuff that I had learned in some of those first classes that I took. Right. I mean, it took me a good solid year. 
Um, mm-hmm. And then maybe at a certain point it went down to kind of like six months, right? Where I could take six months and really work on um, some of the things that I worked from those classes. But re- realistically, I think if folks are, are taking this kind of approach to really looking at the things they're learning in classes and then building a training plan based upon that, it takes a lot of time and work right behind the gun to actually work through um these kind of skills but anyway what are your guys thoughts on on like again if money and time is no object and so on and so on and so forth but how often do you think folks some folks are taking classes too often or or what is kind of an, an optimal cadence if you will in kind of training and classes and that kind of thing yeah, this is like this is gonna sound like a really horrible sales pitch, but um, <laughs> I I think people, some people take too many classes, and it's like, especially if you go to say you take uh, five classes a year from five different dudes, like yeah. are you actually practicing all of the stuff that you learned in all five classes from five different dudes? Because those five different dudes may be teaching the same things. Right, yep. but they're they're saying it in a different way, and, and some of that stuff might strike a chord a little differently with different people. Yep. Um, and so, like, are, are you practicing all of the stuff that you learned? Um, and you know, if taking classes is your thing, then that's cool too. I, I'm definitely not mad at you for that. But uh, yeah, for for me personally, one class a year is a lot for me, right? Because, like you said. That is 100% a year's worth of homework. Um, it just is. So I would stick with one or two a year, personally. I think that's a decent number uh, and work your ass off when you leave those classes. Agreed. And <laughs> and yeah, I would say, you know, if, if, you, if, if you feel like you don't need that, amount of, that, that kind of time to work through that stuff, either uh, I, I would suggest maybe the classes that you're going to um, aren't actually giving you much value and you should figure out a way to, to find better classes or There's take, or take other things. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, or you're, you're not, like we said, you know, actually, actually working through all the things that, uh, that are in the class. It's probably one of the two. Right. And so there's something to consider there. Now I know what a lot of folks are probably, a lot of the folks that take my classes, right. Are probably responding, thinking to themselves we do this is like, Hey, all this sounds great, but like I go to classes because that is kind of my opportunity to actually work on those skills because I don't have like a place to actually work on all this stuff all the time. Like some of the more dynamic movement and, and, and some of that kind of stuff on the range. A lot of folks maybe training, you know, at indoor ranges or whatever the case may be. What is uh, your, your guys' thoughts about someone coming at it from that angle? I mean, be that as it may, uh, you can still dry fire, right? Uh, if you have like a 10 by 10 room, you could set up a lot of stuff and it doesn't matter if there's like a bed in the way I would use that bed as some sort of obstacle, right? You could set up a lot of stuff in a room and figure out movement, um, movement, grip, a lot of that stuff. Um, I don't, I don't feel like you need a ton of, uh, space on a range, although it does come in handy. Um, I would supplement it with dry fire a bunch. Yeah. So, I, I've I've had this. Qu- I've I've talked to a lot of people about this very question, right? Um, one, I think people would be surprised to know uh, the effort that shooters who are putting in a lot of work are actually putting in, right? Like it's not just that they uh, they stepped out their backyard and shot at their backdoor range, uh, which would be legit, right? Like <laughs> kind of like Nick Scott, right? Um, but uh, if you don't have that, like, like, like Nick works really hard, right? But if he had to, uh, he would drive to a range, right? Like, um, and I think some people don't realize that like some really good shooters, yeah, like they don't have uh, easy access to stuff. And so they are driving an hour, two hours, maybe even more uh, to get to a range on a Saturday and shoot like all day, right? Um, and that's like a whole like big ordeal, right? Like maybe they drove four or five hours that day just to, uh, just to get to a range trip. The other thing is like, uh, going to practice score.com, right. And there's all these things called uh, USPSA matches, right. And they are all over. 
And again, like you might have to drive an hour, maybe two hours or something like that to get to a match. But even if you can get to a match, uh, let's say, um, let's say just once a quarter, right? You get to a match once a quarter and that can supplement the stuff you do static dry fire. And then the stuff you're doing with maybe more dynamic or, or static uh, live fire, more uh, supplement some of the more uh, dynamic dry fire stuff that you've been doing, right? And then you can kind of go test that uh, every other month, every quarter, something like that. Um, now you're actually able to like go test your skills and don't necessarily have to uh, go to something and listen to a bunch of lecture and necessarily have a bunch of hands-on coaching, which that's a great thing, uh, but maybe not necessarily need to do that, right? Or you don't have to sign up for a six, 800, 900 round count course, and you can go shoot 200 rounds or less, usually less, at a match um, on a Saturday morning and uh, kind, of, kind of test some of those skills there. So that's what I would say to people who don't have a range. A hundred percent. Right. Um, you know, and look guys, I, 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 not everyone is going to set their priorities, right. For, for training and, and, and ammo budgets and all that kind of stuff, the way that we do, um, <laughs> on the show here today. Right. And some folks are smarter than we are, uh, in that regard, I guess. Right. But, um, look, unfortunately, some of this stuff does take that investment. Like you were saying, Brennan, it, it takes effort. Um, and it, unfortunately, a lot of times costs money. Right. Um, yeah. but what the discussion I think it's worth having is again, like, a am I actually getting any value back from that model of, Oh, well, I'm just gonna go take this, this course like four times a year. Um, and that's gonna be my chance to work on this stuff because, you know, look, I think a, a your average course, like if you get 45 minutes to an hour to like work on an individual skill, like that is a lot in a course, right? That's mm -hmm. a lot. Um, and so let's just say that you get an hour, like, you know, two or three times a year when you go to that course to work on that skill and then you like, don't work on it again for another three months. Like realistically, am I getting better at that skill? And the answer is probably not measurably, like there's not really going to be improvement showing up there. Right. Yeah. And so what is the better way to go about it? Obviously for, for our folks that are out West, there's, they have less of an issue. There's like public land all over the place. A lot of times, right. Places you can just like go out in the desert and shoot stuff. Right. On the East coast. Like I, I, it's, it's so far, everyone that's hit me up. Like it's, it's, it's pretty hard to find a place in the East coast. that doesn't have a public range that will let you do just about anything you want within about two hours of any particular place, you know, on the East coast. Um, for me personally, right, I'll, I'll just, I, about two years ago now, I moved to where I'm within 45 minutes of my range. So every time you guys see me shooting live fire, I have driven at least 45 minutes to do that, right? Before that, for the past, for the eight years before that, I was at least an hour and a half from a range. Um, th that Those entire eight years. And I've been shoot, going to that range at least once a week for, you know, 10, 10 or so years now, right? Um, so yeah, people are out there are driving that kind of distance and doing that kind of stuff, right? Again, those ranges can be, can be an investment. Um, you know, a lot of them require memberships and stuff as well, but I don't know any range that charges more for a first year membership than say like two one day classes. Right. Um, and so again, like bad, bad sales pitch, but I would rather you not take my class three times in a row without practicing. <laughs> I'd rather you take it once and then save up those two class fees and go get yourself a range membership and actually work on this stuff. Um, yeah. Cause I think you're just going to see, you're going to see way better return. Practice is absolutely required um, in order to see improvements. So figure out, figure out ways to be working on the stuff guys, or it's just, you're not, you're not going to see returns from it. Unfortunately, it's just not going to happen. Do you, um, do you mind if we circle back a little bit? Um, sure. I wanted to bring up something. So, uh, a lot, I was taking some notes because uh, I always forget what I'm going to say, but, um, so a lot of what I was going to say, Billy, you kind of already covered as far as kind of, uh, foundations and working up to stuff, something that I, I just wanted to add to that, right? If you go to a class and, um, discover that the, the stuff the instructor is talking about is like, uh, maybe a little beyond what you are ready to hear. Mm -hmm. Um, don't be afraid to, uh, to kind of just, just like settle into some of the more, again, we're gonna use that word foundational stuff, right? But let's, let's say you go to some sort of like competition class or something, and they're gonna talk a lot about, uh, you know, maybe more advanced competition uh, related stuff, but you discover this big hole in your grip, 
right? Um, don't be afraid to just like, like work at that, right? And don't leave, I, I, I really would hate for a, a student to leave a class like that feeling just overwhelmed and discouraged uh, that um, there was so much stuff and they didn't, they didn't pick up on all of it, right? Like what that tells me is that's a really good class, <laughs> right? Uh, there is a lot of stuff there for you to work on and that is a class that you could return to and get, uh, get stuff out of, right? Um, but don't be afraid to be like, look, I've got to do a bunch of work on my grip. Um, like, I know he was talking about some like other stuff, but like, I don't know, that kind of all went over my head, but a bunch of the stuff we talked about in the first uh, half of the morning or whatever was really interesting and really mm -hmm. changed a lot. So like, don't be afraid to work on that stuff. And if that's the kind of class you're going to, um, I would say that class is probably a good class to go back to, right? So I don't think either any of us mean to like never take a repeat class, yep. um, but some classes are like definitely set up to where like, like if you if you go to class and at the end of the day, <laughs> like you can do everything he was talking about, maybe as good or better than the instructor or whatnot, right? Like that might not be a good class to go back to for additional skill building. Yep. Um, but when it's just jam packed of information, um, you know that I think that's a good indication of a good class. The other thing is, uh, if the instructor is worth his salt, in my opinion, uh, his his curriculum should be a pretty good template to use um, as a training day. Kind of, I think Bill, you were you're kind of mentioning this, right? either over a long period of time or depending on your skill level uh, per range day, mm -hmm. right? So uh, depending on how much time, how much ammo you have and things like that, you might use part of it as like, you know, I'm going to talk, I'm going to do the first stuff that we talked about from eight to noon uh, today at the range, or I'm going to touch on this, this, and this, and then I'm going to get right to uh, that main thing that was kind of uh, a, a big, a big thing that I learned in that class. Right. Yep. Um, Using using a curriculum, if it's a good curriculum, as a template through your training plan, I think is a kind of an easy way to just like, just go, right? And also most instructors probably, if you ask them for kind of a, hey, can you remind me bullet point, just kind of what we talked about, that should be really easy for them to send over to you. Um, especially if they know you're gonna like your, your training, right? I think that, that would make me really, really happy if somebody emailed me that. Um, the other thing is like, like classes, like they should give you homework. Right, it should give you home. Um, I think that's the reason that we all like matches so much is that we go and we compete against people who are better than us, um, or sometimes you're competing against yourself depending on the level of skill. Uh, but we come away with like with homework. And if you don't come away with homework from a class, um, you know, I, I heard somebody saying like, uh, well, I guess Nick, you, you said the same thing, right? Like, like one class per year is like enough. Um, but I know for a fact that Nick takes classes from really, really good shooters, <laughs> right? Like if you take- Very picky about it. Yeah, super picky, right? See the see the episode on how to vet instructors, right? Uh, if you're not, <laughs> and you're just kind of like, oh yeah, I heard of this guy, Joe Schmo, and I'm gonna sign up, take class with him. Uh, it might be that you need to take like four or five <laughs> of those random <laughs> classes before you get a good class where there's enough to work on, right? So um, vetting instructors comes in comes into a huge play, I think, in, in this conversation as far as like building a training plan, because like that information needs to be solid. Um, so yeah, that's what that's what I guess I would, would uh, add in. Yeah, great point, right? And some, is there interesting you brought up a thing about like showing up to a class before you're really ready for it, right? I think, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's it's tough um, setting, setting prerequisites or like really describing well, who should show up to certain classes, like is a pretty difficult thing to do. Um, and, certainly, and certainly we, we, I think we all set up our classes to try to be beneficial to different levels of, of shooters and so forth. But at the same time, like, you know, at, at my class, uh, my last class week before last weekend was a great example, right? I had literally had in the class, um, a, a master class USA competitor and a guy who basically had never taken a class before, never shot a competition before. Um, he, nice. he, had take, he had taken a class, right? But it wasn't really like a <laughs> class, right? So he was basically starting from scratch, you know? Um, and it's like, man, enormous, enormously challenging, right? To put on a course that's equally beneficial to both of those guys, right? Um, so definitely stuff was in there. Like by the time I got to it, like attack control transitions like he was you know my beginner guy was like not ready for that right um and it's like that's fine like I'm, I'm gonna explain it at a high level you know the higher level guys can work on that and it's like dude 
you just worry about hitting the targets. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> that's, that's all you need to worry about. If you hit all the things, like I am happy. Right. Um, and totally agree, Brandon. Like that's, that's the kind of thing, like if you can take away some of the entry level stuff that we talk about, like the fundamentals and so forth, go ahead, work on that for a year. And you feel like you just want to come back and take that class again. Like for that guy would probably be super beneficial. Like he's going to get entirely different stuff out of that course a year from now than he got it the first time. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, presuming you know he's 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 put the work in and, and so forth, but yeah, depending so on the, the great caveat, depending on the class and the instructor too, right? Like it might be worth it to go back to that person for like coaching, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I was I was listening to a live stream that Lucas uh, Botkin was doing, and he was talking about how like you should, you know, he was pretty like kind of definitive, right? Like take one class a year, right? Work on all that stuff for you, and uh, like and. I don't know, like, like, I don't just go to classes just for the information, right? Because there are actually enough resources online to get, honestly, 99% of the information that I need, right? Um, but I also go for, like, feedback <laughs> from these really good shooters, really good instructors, uh, mm -hmm. and have them watch my technique and help me diagnose stuff, right? Like, there's a lot to be said for that in-person coaching. Yeah. Um, a ton to be said, right? I mean, that's why any, you know, anyone who's ever watched YouTube shooting or YouTube classes or whatever still will come to a class of the same exact level and get a ton out of it, right? It's because like you don't, it doesn't just directly translate. So uh, don't, I would encourage people maybe not, don't think about it just as like uh, knowledge and like gaining knowledge or gaining information, but also like, go maybe get re refreshed on some of that info uh and then also like get coached and get direct feedback that's super valuable um i would say like at at, at my um point in shooting like that's one of the main things i'm looking for is like hey can you put eyeballs on what i'm doing and talk to me because i paid you to like like be here right and it's that's really nice Right. That's mm -hmm. really nice. Billy knows all about that. Right. I, I passed him all the time uh, <laughs> when he was up here. I was asking him a ton of questions. Um, but a lot of times it's just like, hey, man, like, look at what I'm doing. Right. And when when they're there and they can like give you attention, like that's super valuable, too. So it is. Um, and, and, and obviously, yeah, I mean, uh, individual individual training, like if it's available, it's probably gonna be more expensive. Right. But yeah, super, super valuable. Yeah. Uh, you should be getting some of that in, in any good class that you go to as well. And if, if you're not getting individual coaching, uh, pick a different instructor. <laughs> like that's, yeah, this is to be it's a, it's a completely straight about it. Right. Um, cause a lot of classes, you're not going to get that. Um, but you should, you really, you really should, um, uh, getting hands on individual attention. Super, super, super important. I know, you know, especially that the higher level you get, you know, I think when you, when you're, when you're starting the, you know, whatever the the lecture content, if you will, of each block is probably going to be like mind blowing, and you can just be happy. You can just leave, like not do any shooting. You can just like <laughs> listen to the lectures, you know, if you will, and just like leave, and you'd have stuff to work on. Um, but I know some of the you know some of the more recent classes, like man, the, some of the, my biggest takeaways were stuff that was not a part of the curriculum, right? Um, yeah. From, from the super high high level shooters that I was training with. Um, it came from, from tips like on, on us, on a stage or just you know, stuff that I was, I was doing and didn't even realize it. Right. Um, and so that, yeah, super, super important for sure. Yeah. Good stuff, Bren. What else? We'll, uh, we'll take a, we'll take a question that came in before we wrap up, but anything, um, you guys want to still mention on that whole topic, training plans and yeah, I think understand that uh, there's no magic sauce, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like you brought up fundamentals before, basic fundamentals, and I think people think, well, that's that's basic stuff, and I don't need that. But like, honestly, the only type of advanced shooting is advanced or, or doing the fundamentals at a really, really high level, right? That's advanced shooting. Um, so don't expect any sort of magic sauce and i would just you know try to master the the basic stuff like if, if you didn't know where to start master that basic stuff mm -hmm. yep very good like you, you hear all the time right like uh you know you can't buy performance uh and and that's usually regarding gear right like oh dude buying you buying that new holster buying that new belt whatever optic is not going to make you a better shooter 
uh, you might gain something from it, right? If you're, uh, you know, if you're a good shooter already, uh, but you're gonna have to put in the work to become a better shooter. Um, like you can't just buy training and think it's gonna make you a better shooter either. <laughs> like it's kind of the same thing. Like, um, like just just paying for a class and showing up and participating is not gonna make you a good shooter. Like you have to put in work, man. And like, it takes a lot of work. And like, if you think that, you know, you've heard on the internet or you've heard some people say like, you know, you know, here's what I think about this piece of gear, but also remember you should get training. Like that doesn't mean like, or should it mean just, that means sign up for a class, participate, get a participation certificate and leave. <laughs> like, no, that means like you need to train yourself. <laughs> like yep. get outside feedback, uh, get outside knowledge, and then you've got to train yourself. Like, like you got to practice. It should, it should really be, we should really change it to practice instead of training. Like you need to practice, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So anyways, don't get caught in that thing, right? Like just, you know, oh, I can, I can buy, buy my way into a uh, high performance level by buying a shit ton of classes. Right. Doesn't work that way. Nope. Sure doesn't. Unless, unless you're shooting long range matches, then you could buy six dasher, fuck the wind and 100% uh, <laughs> buy your way in the top 10. <laughs> Uh, I totally uh, saw that. Totally saw that when I when I shot long range. <laughs> I have some I have some sniper friends that I'm gonna that I'm gonna drop that one on. That's yeah. that'll be fun. I can't wait. Yeah, you know it's true, man. Like I saw it myself. Uh, I I started off shooting 308, and then I started shooting uh, 65 Creedmoor, and I was like, oh, word! Like this is way <laughs> this is way easier. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh! Oh, I love it. That is fun. Long range <laughs> jokes. <laughs> Snipers. All right, we got. Uh, so we, we did put out a recent poll again here recently for some uh, the questions on the podcast. We got a couple of funny ones you guys might appreciate. Uh, uh, one guy asked if the host have a favorite Canadian. You guys probably know who that came from. He uh, needs to be beat with a paddle. Beat him with his own freaking canoe paddle. Tell him to shove that thing <laughs> covered in maple syrup up his skinny Canadian ass. Very good. All right. Well, and and the, his president sucks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not both sure. of them. I'm not sure. Yeah. What the both of them? Yeah. Very true. Yeah. Mm. I don't think we have any room to talk about presidents. Um. I love that guy. Why does why does Brennan always beat me in practice? Uh, Brennan probably knows who that one came from. Uh, all right, I'm sitting at 17, 18 splits with a stock Glock trigger. I want to go faster. What do I do? That's <laughs> well, an interesting. The first one. question needs to be uh, why. What's wrong with a 17, 18 split? And if I was able to get down to True. a 12 split, what would I be gaining? Right. Uh, we were, you know, other than like, yeah, I was just gonna say 0.05. <laughs> that's, a, uh, that's an easy one, bro. I got that one. Uh, yeah, I mean, super cool if you could do that, mm -hmm. right? I think it's a good demonstration of uh, grip and my grip in the gun properly. Um, but I don't know, where you... is your other skill set at? Like, first, yeah, I don't know. It's like, not something, goal? it's not something that I would spend a ton of time on. If I could already rip 17 splits on on demand, I'm not sure I would spend time to try to get 12 splits. I see Billy smiling. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just waiting until y'all get done, and I'll answer. So, that question. <laughs> well, so so hang on, hang on. All right, yeah. I know the the split master over there has opinions, but of course. So I would say some of that, like I don't know. I'm assuming you have standard. This person has asked this has standardized it, and they're talking about like open targets at five, seven yards, something like that, right? Um, what I have found, uh, having done a lot of work to inc to decrease my split times, mm -hmm. is that it translates to like 15 and 20 yard shoot as well. Um, a better being able to split the gun super fast and seeing what's going on has like a lot like has has upped my ability to shoot faster splits at fast at farther distances now like i'm not saying that's necessarily like the way to get better at that um but i think it, it has it has some value um 
However, <laughs> like all things being equal, like I don't think that's going to be the thing that's going to win you stuff. Um, but if your goal is uh, being able to, like if that's just your only goal in shooting, then like, yeah, have that, right? And we can maybe talk about how to get there. But um, if like you're trying to like be good at like shooting, like be other people at stuff, like there's a bunch of other stuff that you could work on that might be a lot more rewarding in terms of, in terms of uh, ROI. Yeah, I mean, if, if that is the case, right? Like if he's like, hey, I wanna go shoot a, I wanna go win matches, right? Then I would say work on fast transitions and footwork. Mm -hmm. That is huge, th those two are huge chunks, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. I would put a lot of time into that rather than trying to shave off 500. Although if I could shoot 12 splits, I wouldn't complain about it. But I don't know how much time I want to uh, it's, devote it's gonna, to it, shooting 12 sports. It's going to take a significant investment. Like as somebody who has yeah. shot a lot of rounds recently trying to figure this out, it's going to take a lot of investment. Yeah, because, I mean, honestly, like, I, like I've like i even heard uh, Eric Grafell say this on the podcast. They were like, how do you get fast splits? And he was like, lots of rounds. Like, I'm not <laughs> sure if there's any way around it. You know, um, it's... I'm not even sure if, if like time behind, like nothing is going to replace time behind the gun actually shooting to get faster splits. I don't know. Maybe I'll disagree, what, but in what, my opinion, what do you think? What do you think, Bill Billy? Wait, <laughs> wait, wait for y'all to get done. All right. So definitely agree with that, right? Um, Have it. Eric Fell's so thing, see? right? Uh, there is a thing that, that is a thing. I also know that like a lot of people that have shot a lot more than I have that pull the trigger way slower than I do, right? Um, and so like anything else, I think there, there are certain ways to, to work on things. I think that I agree with everything you guys said. Um, definitely think about priorities of what you're working on. However, if we want to answer the question and help this guy get better, here's how I would do stuff. <laughs> um, to, the, the first caveat on, on it, he said stock Glock trigger. Me and Nick I, are just like, yeah, don't work on it. Yeah, I think I think fifteen splits are an entirely reasonable goal for a stock block trigger. Um, but having a nice trigger certainly helps. But you're, I mean, I don't, I probably can't, I, I can't do twelves as an example with this with a stock block trigger. Like that's gonna be that's gonna be really difficult. Um, I think learning how to get the 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 super spicy splits essentially have three elements, right? So first of all, is my grip squared away enough? And my recoil control is squirrely enough to where if I have those splits, I'm actually going to hit something, right? That's that's pretty important. Um, number two, yeah, uh, is 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 my grip um, going to allow me to have enough essentially dexterity in my trigger finger to move it quickly enough to mechanically get the splits that I'm looking for? So in other words, for a lot of folks, if they're gripping the gun way too hard with your firing hand, it's going to reduce your dexterity in your trigger finger. You're just simply not going to be able to move your finger fast enough to get the splits that you're looking to, to get. So either work on isolation, work on relaxing your firing hand grip, like whatever you have to do to, to figure out how to free that finger up. And the third part of that is simply like getting your brain to process time differently. Um, you know, our, our brains are not used to thinking about things in, in hundreds of a second. Like we, we never use that as a measurement for anything in life for most of us, except for shooting. Like we're trying to do things faster and with greater precision in shooting than we do in, in basically anything else um, or, or in any other area. And so literally, I think for some folks, it, it, we have a mental gap. We, we don't, we can't even think what 12 splits sound like, right? Like I, I'll, I'll be working with shooters on the range and I'll say, you know, just take your hand and like tap the table as fast as you want to shoot. And I'm like, those are not 12 splits, like go faster. You know what I mean? And it's like, they're, they're, they're tapping at 17 splits on the table. And that's as, that's as fast as their brain can even think about doing a thing. Right. Um, and so you have to almost sometimes rewire your brain to think about time differently. One of the, one of the ways that I've found to help folks do that um again cadence drills shouldn't should or can be dangerous you should not be like trying to shoot on a cadence um like on a stage as an example but it, it does help your brain think about time differently so i'll start super super slow like you could think about you know 40 splits or something um and you know on, on a metronome or whatever doing five six six round strings and for your when you're first starting off 
your goal is not to shoot anything faster than that. You're trying to shoot 40 splits, but like a 42 is unacceptable and a 38 is unacceptable. Like you want it to be exactly a 40. Like you're just working on getting the gun to go off exactly at the instant you intend for it to go off within those hundredths of a second. And that's, that's, that's a, a much easier way for most folks to work on getting that consistent with the timing than doing it at speed. Once you're able to do that consistently at like 40s, drop it to like a 30, drop it to like a 25 split, drop it to a 20 split, right? Drop it to a 15 split now. Um, and, and by training your brain to think about those counts and get the gun to go off exactly on those counts, um, it, it can help some folks essentially <clears throat> unlock um, different ways of processing uh, running the trigger than, than they were able to do so previously. Mm -hmm. So that's what I've got. And I think like, yeah, so the other thing too, right? Like um, doubles. Yep. Uh, doubles and then, yeah, like what Billy was saying, the, the cadence drill. Like um, doubles is a really useful drill for that. I did a lot of that. I do actually like um, longer, when you, specifically when you're trying to learn how to pull the trigger faster, I, I, mm. me personally, I distinctly like longer strings than doubles. Um, mm. Doubles is really, really good, I think, for, you know, seeing how you're, analyzing how your sights are moving, what your grip's doing. A lot of folks, if you have them shoot a build drill and you say, hey, what happened on shot four? They're going to mm. be like, what? <laughs> right? Which is why doubles are, are, you know, doing split build drills or, or doubles. I think it has a lot of value because it lets shooter shooters more easily analyze what happened over each pair and make adjustments as they go instead of the string. The reason I like strings for learning how to pull the trigger faster versus doubles is that, um, you, you have to be more honest with, I think the pressures you're putting into the gun. Um, a lot of times when you, you know, as an example, a lot of times when folks are trying to learn this and I have them do a six shot string, like the first two shots of that string will be kind of janky. And then all of a sudden the next four orders like, mm -hmm. like they really yeah. unlock it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you can, you can see things by just pulling the trigger and not think overthinking about it, you know, as much over a longer string than you can, uh, in a, in a double. Um, That's fair. But yes, That's fair. both, both have value for yeah. sure. That's fair. Cool. Good stuff. Hopefully that was helpful for, for that shooter. I've got a handful more we're going to save for future episodes, but uh, I think that'll think that'll do it for tonight, fellas. Uh, again, hopefully that was a lot of helpful information for you guys on building training plans, taking uh, classes, all that kind of good stuff. If you are looking for good classes to take, <laughs> all of our information will be uh, below. Look up these guys, follow these guys on their social media, train with these guys if you get a chance. Uh, I know we would all appreciate it, and I think that I can vouch for everyone here and say that you will not regret, hopefully, training with uh, with any of us, and uh, we would love to see you in a class sometime. With that said, thanks so much for tuning in, and we will see you on the next episode of the Speed Up and Get Your Hits podcast. Thanks, guys.